are defines how you build. Thank you. And it's so awesome to be back, but I'm deeply jealous because we didn't have this engineering quad when I was here. Every single year I come back, I get more and more jealous about how awesome you guys have had it. But Stanford was the best place to have my undergraduate degree, as you'll see in my presentation. So to answer what the baobab tree is, it's this tree um, that is native to Madagascar. And my co-founder, Eric Darnell, directed all four Madagascar films. So we thought it made sense. Also, it has an amazing story, because I'm going to talk about storytelling today, about how the gods were angry at this tree. So they threw the tree down, and it fell upside down. And its roots were the branches instead, and its head was became the roots. And that's why it's such a funny looking tree. But the mission of our company is to inspire you to dream by bringing out your sense of wonder. And we felt this tree really um, showed that. So I'm going to talk today about defining your own path. I'm going to tell you about my path to becoming an entrepreneur. I never expected to become an entrepreneur. I'm deeply introverted, deeply insecure, <laughs> all sorts of issues. So I didn't think I would have what it took to become an entrepreneur. But through my path from Stanford to eBay, through Zynga, from Hollywood, Pixar, et cetera, I found my voice. And that was always by not allowing other people to tell me who I was and who I could be. It's like, am I a woman or am I a man? Am I introvert or extrovert? Am I a fuzzy or a techie? Am I a suit or a creative? And it's rejecting all of that and defining your own path and saying that you can be whatever you want and don't follow um, the buckets that people want to put you in. So my path, I started off at Stanford. Uh, I knew I wanted to do entertainment. So I looked up all the studio's job openings before coming to Stanford and saw what did they want me to major in. It says communications and econ usually. I took those classes, but I loved computer science the most because it was the most difficult. I found that really intellectually stimulating. So I started doing that and then doing symbolic systems because then I started getting excited about logic. And then I took a class at Stanford University Digital Art Center and realized I could combine art with the psychology, with the engineering. And the amazing thing about Stanford is, unlike the other schools out there, which are mostly on the semester system, the quarter system allows you to take as many classes as you want. So I took all sorts of classes, like coastal environmental zone, where I was supposed to travel different beaches on the California coast and study them, which is the best class ever. Highly recommend that you guys take that class. Um, but I fell in love with animation in particular. And I sought to design my own major. And Stanford is one of these schools that allows you to do it. I think Brown is the only other school, I believe, that lets you do it. Um, Stanford doesn't believe that you know what you want to do until you've tried out a bunch of classes, which is totally true. So I designed my major here. And then I went to eBay. So why did I go to eBay when I wanted to do animation? It's called Tiger Parents. So I really <laughs> wanted to do animation so badly. But my uh, parents, I'm Asian, my <laughs> Chinese parents told me that I would be poor and destitute if I followed my dreams and that I need to do something practical. So instead of following my dreams to Lucasfilm, I took a job at eBay, which was also super awesome. So no diss on eBay. Um, because it also used art, psychology, and computer science. So that was great. But the entire time I was there, I would take classes at De Anza College, community college, because all the Lucasfilm animators would teach there. So at nighttime, I'd take the classes, thinking about the day that my stock options would be worth enough so I could finally escape and do my true passion. But by taking these classes at night, I really learned about the skill of animation and continue to define my own path there instead of just doing one thing. I also found that by drawing every single day and doing art, it made me better at my job at eBay on the business side, which I thought was really strange because I thought it was always about focusing and just doing one thing. But by being cross-disciplinary, that's when um, you start finding connections between the different disciplines. The best advice I ever got was from a professor here. Her name was Lori Loeb. She was a visiting professor, and she taught animation. She's at Dartmouth now, leading up animation. And back when I was at Stanford, when I was all angsty about wanting to do animation and my parents not letting me, she said, don't worry about knowing what you want to do. The most important thing is to do whatever job it is that you have and do it really well. Because you'll learn something that will help you in your path later. And the people around you who see you work so hard with your work ethic will come out of the woodworks later on and help you. And I'll show you through the path how that actually did happen. So finally. 
after doing eBay five years, I'm like, it's time. I've saved up enough money. It's time to pursue my passion. And I was going to apply to Art Center to get an MFA. But guess what? The deadlines had passed, and I was really sad. And my mom said, why don't you apply to round three of business school? And I thought, because I hate business. But like a dutiful Confucian daughter, I applied to Harvard, and I got in. Um, but I was going to say no, because I knew I just really wanted to do this animation thing. It's very stubborn. But my boss at eBay said, don't be an idiot, Maureen. You think Hollywood's so cool. It's sexy, but you don't know. Don't say no to Harvard. First, go try it out, and then make your decision. So I emailed everyone in the Stanford Alumni beta Database that had anything to do with entertainment animation, like five people or so. And they all responded me, to me, because the Stanford Alumni Database and network is very strong. And they gave me all sorts of internships in Hollywood. So I quit my job at eBay. I drove down to Hollywood. And I took on every single internship I could possibly get my hands on to learn. So I was doing script development with Michael Ellenberg, who is now the HBO drama dude, um, and also talent manager assistant to Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Zach Braff and Paul Dano. And I learned from that experience that everything is a business at the end of the day, and that my mom is always right, and that I should go to business school. So I went ahead and went to business school, where I ran for uh, president of Entertainment Media Club. But there I was super angsty, too, because they are mostly from the East Coast. And they would say, oh, you're that creative person. And I was put in math camp, because I didn't come from a finance and consulting background at the time, and found my own path there. So internship between business school years is the most important thing you can do in business school. So I applied to Pixar. Ali Rogani, who is a graduate of Stanford GSB, was the CFO of Pixar. And he's like, oh, you should totally come do accounting finance. I hate accounting. So I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I want to get paid minimum wage to bring coffee for the crew of the Pixar staff. But they were angsty about that, too, because they said, you're from business school. You belong here with the numbers. You're a suit. You're not a creative. So I had to fight real hard to form a path to make sure that I got the internship that I wanted. And the amazing thing there is because I told my boss on Toy Story 3 sets department what it is that I want to learn, which was how to become a producer. She designed an internship for me, where usually interns get to only stay with one department. I was with a sets department. They make all the environments. You can only stay with one department the whole time. She formed an internship where I could shadow every single department, editorial, art, characters, et cetera. And that's because I told her what it is that I wanted. The point is to always ask for what you want, because people in general want to make you happy and want to help you. And if you don't ask for it, it's not going to happen. So especially for ladies out there, you definitely have to do this, because dudes just naturally do it, not to generalize. Um, so I worked on Toy Story 3 in production. And then after that, um, instead of going back to Pixar, because I realized from my newly awesome Harvard Business School education that starting an animation company was really hard. Because if I had one flop of a film, if I didn't have a theme park division to buffer against the loss, my entire company would probably go down. Also, unfair, unless I had huge amounts of capital or unfair distribution advantage, it probably didn't make sense to go compete against a Disney, Pixar, or DreamWorks. But I was also attracted to startups, and Pixar was a very mature industry at the time. And I wanted to be part of something new, creating a new industry. So I joined Zynga right when they started and was there for six years. And I started off on Farmville and became vice president of games after six years, looking over the Farmville franchise. And that was crazy. I did not sleep. And I slept four hours a night, clicking refresh on my computer at like 2 AM in the morning to see if the numbers are going to go down, because I didn't want Mark Pincus to yell at me. The numbers went down because he has a dashboard every morning where he sees every game and day over day change and week over week. And if it was red and down, then you were in trouble. So I was constantly clicking refresh. It was traumatic. But I learned so much about what it meant to be an entrepreneur and what it took to start a company. Because in business school, they teach you to be a certain type of leader, which is very different from what it takes to be a startup leader. It requires different management styles for different types of company. And if you've heard of wartime CEO versus peacetime CEO, it's very relevant. You should definitely read that. It's, I can't remember if it's by Ben Horowitz or Andreessen Horowitz. So you should definitely read that, because it will turn your thinking upside down on what it means to be a leader. So, But even when I was at Zing, I just loved animation. So on nights and weekends, despite sleeping four hours a day, I worked on a short animated film called The Dam Keeper with my two friends from Pixar. 
and we made a short film that ended up getting nominated for the Oscars. So that was awesome. I just couldn't stop doing animation, but I couldn't figure out how to make it work from a business perspective. So I had this art side of my brain, right? What I really love, my passion, my idealism. And then I had this super business school, practical Asian parent side of my brain. And what I was trying to do this entire time is figure out, can I merge the two together? Can I be both or do I have to end up choosing to be one or another? But every single step I took, I try to create my own path in the role that I wanted instead of letting them put me where they wanted to. Which is why I started my own company because then you can make it whatever you want. So these are my three co-founders. And Eric, um, like I said, he directed all four Madagascar films and ants. And Larry Cutler, Stanford grad, both undergrad and master's in computer science. And his thesis, I believe, was even on VR back in a long time ago where it was not even <laughs> commercially viable, but now very relevant. And he went to Pixar right when he graduated, a technical director, and then became DreamWorks head of all character technology. And he's a judge for the Oscar Technical Achievement Awards. So the reason I put this slide up isn't to brag, even though they're sweet. The reason I put this up is to explain how I got in touch with these people and how the path helped. Eric Darnell, I met through Glenn Entis. Glenn Entis is a co-founder of PDI DreamWorks Animation and the former CTO of DreamWorks Interactive and the CEO, wait, became EALA, and he was the CEO of DreamWorks Interactive. He was a consultant advisor at Zynga. And as soon as I realized what he did in the past, I'm like, you will be my mentor. And he said, no, I'm retired, I don't time, and my wife wants me at home, I don't time for you. And I said, I'm gonna become best friends with your wife. And he says, we'll see about that. So it all worked out, I'm friends with his wife, and he's now my advisor. And so when I decided to start this company, I asked him, hey, can you introduce me to Eric? Because he hired Eric into DreamWorks for his first job. Eric was an animation intern and became a big badass director. So he introduced me to him. Now, Larry, remember when I said I emailed everyone in the Stanford alumni database to get a job? He was one of the people I emailed, and he was one of the people who responded. He said, do not go to business school. Actually, everyone said, do not go to business school. And I totally ignored everything they said, which he says was a good decision now. You can always justify your past. Um, so Larry, I kept in touch with, and I ran into him during a Chinese New Year's parade in San Francisco where he was taking pictures of his daughter fan dancing. I was like, hey. He's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm starting a company. He's like, oh, maybe I should join you. And that's how it all happened. So within one month, I found my two co-founders. And then Glenn Entis introduced me to Alvy Ray Smith, the co-founder of Pixar. I emailed him to be my advisor. He's like, listen, Maureen, I hate games. I don't believe in VR. Sorry, it's not going to happen. I said, let me just meet you. So I met him at the Crate Vine. I put the headset on him, which is a mobile headset. He's like, I'm going to be your advisor. So it's about persistence and constantly asking. And then he introduced me to Glenn Keane, who is my favorite out of all these. I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but he's my favorite out of these because he was the directing animator of The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, um, Pocahontas, all those things there, Tarzan, Tangled, Aladdin. He's the most famous animator alive. So he joined our advisory board as well. Uh, Eric knew Mireille Soria, the president. She's now the president of Paramount. She was the president of DreamWorks Animation. And then through all this stuff, I applied to Tribeca Film Festival to show our piece and then became friends with Jane Rosenthal, who heads up Tribeca Film Festival and is Robert De Niro's producing partner. But the point of all this is, it's all through networking, and it's all through being persistent and asking each person to help you introduce you to another person. And even if they say no, you persist until they say yes, because people in general do want to help you. Okay, so then I went about getting investors, and this all happened as well in a month. I had unrealistic expectations. I thought I would get funding in two weeks. Um, and it was, it took me four weeks to get funding, which is really good, but I thought I was a massive failure at three weeks. I'm like, oh no, and I was under the covers crying, like, oh no, I'm never going to get money for this company. But what was interesting is it was, again, through my network that I got all this investment. The first one who led my Series A, six million, was Gavin Teo. I knew him because he was a PM at Zynga. And while no one believed in VR at the time, especially not content, he told his bosses, like, hey, it doesn't matter if you even believe in what Maureen's doing, she's crazy, because I know she was at Zynga and she'll find a way to make you money, so just give her money. So it was really helpful that I worked at Zynga with Gavin. And then through 
Um, the Taiwanese network, so Steve Chang uh, was the founder of Tiburon, who makes all of EA Sports and Madden franchise. EA bought them. He introduced me to Phil Chen, who is the chief content officer of HTC and the person who created the HTC Vive. He introduced me to him because Phil Chen wanted to figure out how to bridge more Taiwanese um, Silicon Valley connections. We spoke, and then he liked what I was doing, introduced me to the CEO of HTC, and she immediately said, I want to give you money. Um, so that was through that Taiwanese connection. Samsung was just at a dinner. I met Ajay Singh, who's the best VC ever, and you should all go seek funding from him. Um, I sat next to him at a dinner. He just really impressed me, and he's like, all right, give me money. <laughs> and then I know it's making it sound really easy. It's really awful. Fundraising was the worst experience of my life, other than you know, getting broken up with. But it was still you know, a difficult experience. But with the right connections and perseverance, <laughs> you can do it too. And then um, uh, Phil Chen eventually went to Horizons Venture um, who is, is the biggest fund in China, along with Alibaba and Tencent. And so he introduced me to the, the head of the fund there as well. And then Mark Pincus was my old boss. And I was like, Mark, you owe me. Farmville, give me money. And so he also introduced me to Peter Thiel and uh, through other connections to Yoku. And for entertainment, we have Comcast Ventures, like I said, 20th Century Fox, Chernin, Peter Chernin. Advance It is run by Sherry Redstone, the chairwoman, vice chairwoman of Paramount Viacom and Evolution Media Capital, which is CAA and TPG. So, and SMG is the biggest uh, media conglomerate in all of China because, you know, China's where all entertainment's going, so we want to make sure to have access to that market. One thing you'll find interesting here is they teach you in business school not to go for strategics. You should go for financial institutions. I found that strategics have been incredibly helpful to me because I knew that VR was going to take forever. All these people going to pitch, VCs are like, oh, it's here, VR is here. I did the opposite thing. I said, VR is not here. VR is going to take forever. And because of that, I need an investor who's going to stay with me for the long term. Are you the one? Because you should be honored that I'm even talking to you. And you should be honored to give me money. So that's the attitude, by the way, you have to take when you're seeking funding. But um, the strategics were helpful because they were invested in VR themselves. So they cared about VR. They needed to succeed. So they need my content. So they can ride out the waves, the bumpy, the hype cycle, you know, the, the Gartner um, hype cycle, the trough of disillusionment, all that wave. And so they've provided a lot of help. And they know where things are going because they have all the data right, for their headsets. They give me all that information. They tell me what their strategy is. They give me free technology, all that. So it's been actually quite helpful for me to have strategic investors. OK, how many of you are athletes? How many of you are musicians or singer-songwriters? How about astronauts? Come on, at least one. <laughs> OK, so usually because you guys are young and idealistic and wonderful, you guys actually raise your hands. But usually, if I were to ask this question to a room of adults, nobody would raise a hand. And when you were five years old, you all thought you could be all those things. So the question is, if you don't believe that you can be all these things now, what happened? from when you were five to becoming an adult that made you think that some of these things were no longer possible. Right? Maybe someone told you your sculpture and art class wasn't quite right, or you had a tiger parent who told you you should be more practical. But deep down inside, we believe that everyone has a dreamer still inside. And we know this to be true, because it's why you guys all go to the movies. It's why you go watch games, play games. It's because you want to meet characters and be in situations and scenarios that you wouldn't necessarily encounter in real life. And that is what we care about. And this is why I love animation. I love animation so much that I couldn't stop trying to get back to animation through the entire path, right? And animation to me is all about taking you to completely different worlds, ones that you could have never imagined, and making them feel so real that you think you could reach out and touch it. And those last two sentences that I just said down there takes you to a different world and makes it real. That's the definition of VR and AR, which is why I think that VR and animation and AR are made for each other. And the mission of our company, ultimately, is to bring you back to that five-year-old self in your, that you have inside you, to bring out your sense of wonder and inspire you to dream again. Because then you would all go for your dreams. You would realize how much potential you have actually go for it rather than being scared that you can't achieve your dream and what an awesome place the world would be if everyone actually pursued their dreams. So I want to show you really quickly what the company does and I'll dive into storytelling, 
why I think it's important for humanity and evolution and storytelling as well. At Bam Bam Studios, we're focused on doing immersive storytelling in virtual reality with characters that audiences can fall in love with. When I watch animation, I feel that I'm taken back to that five-year-old sense of self where I thought anything was possible. And our mission is to inspire the world to dream by bringing out your sense of wonder. Whoa. I had been working for over 20 years directing feature animated films and put on a VR headset for the first time. It blew me away. It's like this undiscovered frontier. We see virtual reality as a new medium for telling stories and creating great cinematic experiences that are character driven. It allows people to be taken to places and to worlds that otherwise wouldn't exist. When audiences saw Invasion, they reacted to the world and the characters in ways that we never imagined. And that interactivity and that connection and that eye contact was really significant. And we realized we were really onto something. So then when hand controllers came out, we started our next piece, Asteroids, determined to make the viewer a character inside this story that had hands that could actually interact with the world around them. Crow the Legend was a piece that we always wanted to do from the very beginning. It started off as a Native American folktale that was spread through word, and we are turning it into a VR animation to take the story to the next level. Hey, that sounds like... Another way we look at what we're doing at BevAb Studios is to take advantage of, of what we already know about the empathy of filmmaking and cinema and the interactivity of games and the motivation to act that we have in real life when things really matter and we really care. And so when we have all those pieces of the puzzle working together, then we have an experience that's unlike an experience you could have in any other medium. How many of you have tried VR? Wow, it's amazing. Okay, how about AR? <laughs> AR is going to have the same problems that VR has, just a secret. Um, anyways, um, okay, so why did I start this company? Um, so the first time I put on a VR headset, I hated it. I um, well, I was watching that Paul McCartney music video, and it's like, oh, you can be right there. But all I could notice was the poor resolution and the pixels, because the headsets weren't advanced enough. But when I put on the headset when I was at Zynga, we hacked our game into it for fun. It wasn't even, it wasn't even moving. There was no animated image. It was just a cartoon right in the background. And I realized that this is the future of animation, because animation, for, to, when you watch animation, it's suspension of disbelief, right? You don't expect it to look real, and you get completely sucked in. So you're not noticing the pixels, versus when you're doing re real life or you know, special effects, you have, we, we care so much about whether or not it looks real or not, which is why sometimes, like, if you guys watch the old Final Fantasy movies, you know, it feels kind of weird. You can tell that they're not really human. So I was really excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to go do this immediately. I need to join a company. But I couldn't find a company that did what I wanted to do. So that's why I had to start a company. So it wasn't because I always thought, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, because it's really hard. Totally worthwhile, but really hard. And so I, I kind of stumbled my way into it. And uh, I love storytelling. So there's this theory. How many of you have read the book Sapiens? So there's this theory, evolutionary um, theologists, not theologists, researchers, believe that the reason why Homo sapiens might have been survival of the fittest and won out is because of rumors, which is our ability to tell stories. You can say, there's a lion over there, don't go over there. Or someone's like, hey, Hector killed the lion with this chisel in this way. And all the kids around the campfire are like, oh my gosh, I want to be just like Hector. It's about putting yourself in another person's viewpoint and putting yourself in another scenario. And you kind of wonder, what would I do if I were in that situation? But in VR, you don't have to wonder. You actually are in that situation. You actually have to act, and it reveals who you are. But storytelling is extremely powerful because it gets you to care so much about a character that you want to watch to the end of it, right? Because you want to know what happens to that character. You want them to fail. You want them to succeed. And we believe that VR and AR lets you care about that character even more so than all its previous mediums. So to give you an example, you see this scene right here in Invasion, which is the first experiment that we ever did. This little bunny comes up and sniffs you. Now, this isn't 
you know, crazy because if you think about, if you watch Deadpool, right? Deadpool comes up and talks to you. It's called breaking the fourth wall. You don't usually in cinema break the fourth wall. The player actors don't acknowledge you because you're in your theater seat and you kind of know that Deadpool's not actually talking to you. But this weird thing happens in VR. People would actually get on the ground and start bouncing around, mimicking her motions, absolutely sure that she was reacting to them when actually it was canned animation at the time. They would try to reach out and pet her. They would coo at her, they would talk to her, they would wave at her. And there's this scene where the aliens have their lasers pointed at you and she's hiding behind you and people say, oh my gosh, I'm a bunny shield, I need to save her. And, said, and I can feel the snow and her breath on my shoulder and it was really the air conditioning in our office. But they just <laughs> believed it to be real because when you're in VR, your animal brain makes you believe that this thing is real. And how powerful is that? If you start believing that she's real, how much more do you bond with her? How much more do you want to see what happens? How much more responsibility do you feel you have for her and want to actually help her, right? And this ended up, at, at the beginning, no one gave us a time of day. <laughs> we started our company because they're like, no one wants to watch animation and comedy. They only want hardcore zombie shooting games. This ended up becoming the number one downloaded experience across all headsets, beating out all the games, beating out all the licensed IP and all that. And we think it's because of this specific moment. Because afterwards, people are like, I want that bunny. And we made a plushy bunny so they can hug it. Then tell your friends about it. And then if you're a person and you buy it Christmas and you want to share it with your kids or your nieces and nephews or your grandma, what are you going to show them? Right? You're not going to necessarily have them shoot zombies. Right? But you love showing them a cute bunny that's going to come talk to you. So we want to take our learnings from that moment when she's making eye contact with you and put that into asteroids, and then hand tr controllers came out. So we said, can we make you not only care about these characters because you believe they're real, but can you do something about that caring now? Turning empathy into action is called compassion. Can we get you to act on behalf of these characters? So in asteroids, you are this menial task robot. You're the lowest of the low. You're in space with mac and cheese, or <laughs> the two aliens, and you, um, with peas as your robot sidekick. <laughs> and you are helping them on your mission, but you suck and they don't respect you. But by the end, if you help them enough, you redeem yourself. You have your own little character arc. You save somebody's life, and you become a respected member of their team. And they bow to you and thank you at the end. And you become a respected member. So that was really interesting because we wanted to test with that. But we also learned that interactivity, a lot of people have tried to merge games and film together really hard because when you put interactivity in there, people just want to push all the buttons and interact and they completely ignore the story, right? But by putting interactivity in there, then they become even more immersed. So it's trying to figure out that fine line between the two things. So we iterated on Crow. So, oh, by the way, we won an Emmy for both Invasion and Asteroids, so we're really excited about that. And we got Ethan Hawke um, for Invasion and for Asteroids, we had Ingrid Nilsson, the famous YouTuber, as well as Elizabeth Banks, because I'm all about casting women. <laughs> and for Crow the Legend, this one's going to launch really soon. It's starring John Legend, who is a star and also executive producer, Oprah, um, Ty Sheridan from Ready Player One, Constance Wu from Crazy Rich Asians and Fresh Off the Boat, my favorite show of all time, uh, Liza Koshy, uh, the top uh, number two YouTuber, and also Diego Luna um, from Rogue One. So we have a sweet, sweet cast, and we are poor start. Okay, not that poor because we raised thirty-one million dollars, but still <laughs> poor. So like you know, stars are expensive. <laughs> so it's like, how did we have? Like I have to pinch myself. How did we get all these people to be excited about being in our project? And for them, it was about the themes of this piece. So Crow is about based off of Native American tale about how the crow used to have gorgeous rainbow feathers, colorful feathers, and how. He became the crow that you know today, black with the cawing voice. And basically what happens is it becomes winter on Earth. Before it was all, it's like Eden, beautiful. It becomes cold. And crow is the one who has to sacrifice himself by flying into the sun to bring fire and warmth back to the Earth. But in the process of flying to the sun, his feathers turn all black. They get burned, and his voice becomes like the crow's <laughs> voice today. And there are deep Native American themes about sacrifice and community and what we learned through this process and of adapting it is Native Americans were put into re-education camps and told that they weren't allowed to tell these stories because they were pagan. And so we were really excited about being able to tell these types of stories and partnered with Native Americans and philanthropy in order to tell the story. 
So we have Sarah Eagleheart, which is the coolest name ever, and also Randy Edmonds, uh, who's a tribal elder who voiced characters in here, but also helped us to make sure that we were true to the original vision. But in this one, we made you the spirit of the seasons. So you are the asshole who makes it winter. So you wave your hands around. Sorry if I'm allowed to curse. But they say, there's a study that said that the more you curse, the more successful of an entrepreneur you are. So <laughs> <laughs> anyways, so instead of having you <laughs> push buttons, um, because we don't want people, when you're in the headset, we don't want you to think, which button do I need to press to make what happen? Because that takes you out of the experience. We decided we wanted it to be seamless. So you don't have to push any buttons. You just wave your arms around, and that is what incites the action. And so when you wave your hands this way, you make the flowers bloom. And when you wave your hands, you make the snow fall. And so you turn it into winter, and you make it so that the animals are frigid and maybe going to die and <laughs> forcing crow to go. But we wanted to see if this time, instead of being a fly on the wall or a passive viewer or someone just with arms, what is it like if you have power over these creatures, but they don't know you exist? You have responsibility. What do you choose to do as a human being? Like, like, will you try to screw with them, or will you actually try to help them? And we're really excited about this piece. Um, as you notice, the cast that we cast, I want to make sure that it was an inclusive cast, because especially in Hollywood, there are very few minorities or women behind and in front of the camera. So that's something that I felt was important, which I also think is very important in VR because it's combining two super male dominated industries, right? You have tech and you have gaming, the two industries that I come from. And when we're creating a completely new industry, it's the we have a chance to actually make sure that women are there from the really beginning, which by the way means that there needs to be women where the money's at. Um, because there was a study, I believe, from Stanford that showed that a woman who's doing um, a presentation for pitching to a VC with the same exact pitch deck as a male is, I believe, 40% less likely to get funding. The exact same pitch. And I think the Stanford study was showing slides with a female voiceover versus a male voiceover. Same exact deck. Woman was less likely to get funding. So you got to fix that. And <laughs> you guys can do it. Um, so. For a lot of ladies, it would be great if you guys didn't only be the ones to start companies, but also are the money, because that's where a lot of the power is at. It's like who you decide to fund, ultimately. OK. So if there was a little girl crying on a park bench, let's say Central Park, and she's too young to be by herself, if you see her crying in a film, you're going to feel really bad for her, but you're probably not going to get out of your seats right, and go like touch the screen and try to help her, because it's in a theater. In a game, you go talk to her, but maybe the reason you talk to her is because you're trying to win. You're trying to get a key, get information to solve a quest, get to the next level. It may be very egocentric. It's a story of you. In real life, you would go talk to her because you genuinely care about her, and you're worried about her, and you want to save her. right? So we believe that VRAR allows you to have the empathy of film, where you care so much about that character. You have the agency of games, where you can do something about your caring. But you do it because you genuinely care, not because you're trying to win. And we think this is the magic of what VR AR gives us. And it's a completely new medium and something that we are super excited about. So I'm just going to conclude. That's why I love VR. That's why I love animation. But the real theme of the entire piece is to not allow anyone to ever bucket you into any category that you can absolutely define your own path. Like Every single step of the way, people are trying to tell me, even at Pixar, every step of the way, people want you to be one thing or another. You just refuse to do that. And you say what it is that you want. And the people around you who respect you will help you get what it is that you want. But you have to say that you want it. Because you all have much more potential than you realize. And as you grow older, you're still young and idealistic, which is great. And keep <laughs> But there is this tendency for society to try to get you to conform to societal values of money, fame, fortune, beauty. Just resist that and remember who you are today, because this is the version of yourself and the idealism that you want to keep, especially if you want to start something new. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions that I can answer? You're going to make me feel like I suck if you don't ask questions, so you have to ask questions. <laughs> Guilting works great. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering, what were your uh, biggest takeaways from your time at Harvard Business School? What was one of my business, biggest takeaways at Harvard Business School? Um, three things. 
So one is it gave me confidence in knowing what I didn't know. So I don't remember a thing that I learned at <laughs> Harvard Business School because you learn so many different topics, it's impossible for you to remember everything. But now I know a little bit about every aspect of business. So I know that if I know in general when I approach a problem, oh, I need to know more about finance for this thing then I can go back into my books or look, or I just ask my friend who's really good at finance. That's the other good thing about business school, of course, is the incredible network that it gives you. The other thing I learned, so therefore I'm not scared, right? Before I'm like, business. What is this business thing? It could be all these things. Now I know what it, are all the categories or things within business, so I feel confident. The other thing is in business school, they have you go through real life cases that CEOs had to go through. For example, like the Tylenol case. They're like, what happened if you found that one of them was tampered with? Um, and some, a kid ate it and, and pa passed away, you're the CEO, what would you do now? What would you do in crisis management? So you deal with these scenarios like five cases a day where you have to raise your hand and say what you would do. By training you do that over and over again every day, it trains a muscle in you of decision making. It teaches you like really quickly how you um, synthesize information and get to an answer as quickly as possible. Though you have to be careful because um, then you might start only thinking in one way. And the amazing thing about uh, at business school classes, it's affirmative action to the like exponential degree where they they have in every single classroom. It's exactly this percentage of women to men, this many oldest children, this many middle children, this many young, this many races from all the industries. The reason they do that is because every single person in that classroom will answer the question differently of what they would do as a CEO, and they are they argue so convincingly that you realize that there isn't a right answer. It's just who you are and the way you answer, and you realize that. Strategy is important, but it's actually not as important as being able to align your company around whichever direction you go. Even if you have the perfect strategy, you can't align everyone around it, it's totally useless. It's better to have a crappy strategy, but at least get everybody rowing in the same direction. Uh, and the last thing I learned um, was, what was the third thing? I can't remember it, but if I do, I'll come back to you. Another question? Do you feel that virtual reality will ever move beyond animation towards live action? I'm biased because animation, why else? Why would you want anything other than animation? I think would VR ever go beyond animation, right? Um, animation's perfect, you don't need anything else. <laughs> yes, I believe that VR is not just about entertainment. Entertainment happens to be what I'm excited about, but I'm really excited about, for example, what Jeremy Valenson at Stanford Lab is doing, right? He's uh, make, he, you look at a mirror in VR and you, you see that you're a black woman, right? And after when you take off the headset, after you've interacted as a black woman, you feel completely different. You empathize with different races, different cultures. He has this one where you are homeless. You go through the process of becoming homeless. You lose your house. You have to choose which items in your house you want to save and sell and whatnot. It's really, it's amazing. And then afterwards, he's proven that people are more likely to donate like to homeless and they have different viewpoints. It, it's this whole entire thing I just said about the empathy right, in, in action. You actually care about these places more. And that excites me because given the world today, I guess people have said that at every single phase of life. The world today. But given the world today and all the differences when you're in that headset, it makes you empathize and puts you in somebody else's shoes literally and helps you connect with somebody else. And it just brings out, I believe, our humanity. But medical advances, for sure, like practicing surgery. Or Jeremy has started his company, Striver, for example, which have, I think, Stanford athletes have to actually practice different scenarios in the line. I don't know anything about football, but you <laughs> see, the go Stanford. Um, <laughs> when you're in the lineup, like what would you do when people are rushing at you? There's so many. And even think about browsing the web. Right now, we have this flat screen. If you can browse in VR and 3D, like would you actually have filing cabinets? Or like how would you browse? How would you organize things? I think it's going to change absolutely every single industry, not just entertainment. In the back. Uh, Yes. <laughs> and then, and then you. What do you think is the future of VR tech, like uh, beyond goggles and the handsets? Did you say what is uh, beyond? The future of VR tech, the actual okay. tech side, like the goggles yes. and the handsets. What is the future of VR tech besides like goggles and hand controllers? So the ideal is that you don't have all this equipment because all this equipment serves to take you out of the experience, right? You, you forget that you're totally immersed when you have to fumble around with buttons or you have this big, super heavy thing on your head that is awful for women with bangs <laughs> or, or for tiny heads because they're made for larger heads. Um, right now, 
we're moving towards the next generation um, of headsets. Uh, Oculus Connect was last week, just announced you know, their wireless headsets, six degrees of freedom, so that you can look and move in every single direction that's run on a unit that's not a cell phone or a PC. Everything else was um, previous generation of headsets were always tethered to say a mobile phone or to a PC, something that wasn't built for VR, and now they're creating standalone headsets that are made specifically for AR and VR, so that's great. But it's still you know, big and heavy, so it's exciting when we don't have that. And uh, the exciting thing about the next generation doesn't have wires, because it's really difficult right now to set up all the headsets. You have to light, mount the light stations. It can't have two shiny mirrors, objects, or else it messes up the positional tracking. You might walk into a wall, like all these difficult things. And so they're working on all these different um, areas to make it easier. But I'm hoping eventually it's like the holodeck, where you can wear anything, and you just interact freely. Um, and maybe just you wear the clothes, and the clothes automatically, like Ready Player One, or something, you're, you're ready in the you're already in the experience without needing to put anything on. And then you had a question? Yeah. Uh, I just want to know what tools do you use um, to escape the box when you feel like your artistic mind is being trapped by the more logical and rational side? What do you do when you feel like you're trapped in the artistic box um, or log logical box uh, that your artist is contained, basically? Is that, am I asking the question correctly? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I do is I draw. That's what I learned at eBay. I didn't, I just kept on drawing every day, whether it's for five minutes or 10 minutes, because I thought I didn't want to lose the artistic side of me. But the strange thing is, it actually made me think more creatively on a business strategy point of view, because everything starts blending together. And I think that was one of the greatest strengths of the major that I created. You would think that psychology, art, and computer science are so different, but I learned that they're all actually underlying underlying theory is similar. It's about when I learned about paradigms, right? Like when you're painting, do you start with the uh, fuzziness first and then go into detail? Or do you start in light and shadows? Or do you start with the details first and go wide? Same with coding. Like do you start with object oriented? Uh, like, or straightforward? Like, like all these different things. You start realizing that there are connections between all disciplines that you didn't know were there. And it helps you think at a higher, more abstract level. I know that sounds really abstract, but trust me. <laughs> so when you do try to um, do things other than what you do normally in your job, I do think that it makes you better at your existing job. Maybe one more. OK. All the way in the back there. Uh, so my question is uh, about the code, the movie. How much does the audience have control over the plot? Do you have like two story arcs? Can the spirits be like, good and not move the plot? Like, how do you control the movie of the plot, given the, 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 the audience control? That's question one. And question two is, is there any two-way connection from the animation to the audience? Like, are you working on anything that, that, that makes me feel the sense of touch, maybe? I don't know what, what, what is up, but is there anything up coming? OK, we have a two-parter here. So <laughs> number one is, how, does, how much control and agency do you have in the experience? Um, and two, uh, how, do you have feedback back from the animation, like feeling touch and things like that? So for the first one, um, we, every single experience that we've done has been different, and there's not one right way. In some, you have less. The only interactivity where the game engine detects where you are is where you are in the scene, and then the other characters follow you with the eyes. That's the only interactivity and invasion. With asteroids, you literally have hand controllers, and you actually you can decide to save the alien or not. In that one, we made it so that even if you don't, the other character rips off your arm <laughs> and does the right thing anyway. Um, but the audience doesn't know that you know, it's still going to happen the same way no matter what. But the ending does change because you no longer become a respected member of their team. So you no longer have your awesome character arc because you, didn't, you did nothing. So it's instead of branching narrative, we thought about it as branching emotions. The relationship that you have with the character changes based off of what you do and don't do. And about the two-way feedback, right now the feedback is dependent on the controllers and the devices that you have. And the best we can have right now is like rumble, <laughs> like rumble pack. It rumbles and then you have like sound feedback and visual feedback, but the only haptic feedback so far is that rumble. That being said, people are creating jackets and different types of things that can give you different types of feedback as well. And people are also working on olfactory devices that actually give you like smells based off of what you do as well. Thank you.